tonight we're going to have a little bit of a shotgun sermon. I'm going to be going tonight with truth. And uh, so <laughs> it's one of those nights. I promise you we are not going to go late. I promise you that, okay? But I do have 23 points to give you. So 2 John chapter 1. Go to 2 John chapter number 1. It's just going to be one of those nights. And uh, it's going to be a shotgun sermon. And uh, so that's just kind of how it's going to be tonight. Second John, are you, are you, grab your Bibles. And again, we're going to use our Bibles about 26 times or 25 times tonight. So please don't forget that. All righty. Second John chapter number one. And if you would please look down at verse number one. Second John chapter one. Are you there? All right, look at verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. All right, I want to speak to you this evening on things that accompany salvation, part number nine. Man, we're, we're already two months into this series, and I'm looking forward to all the sermons that God's going to give us, but we're going to talk about truth tonight, the subject of truth. Do you need a pen, Miss Snow? Brother Mike, would you or Brother Josh uh, grab? Oh, you got one? Never mind. Okay, you got a pen. All right, praise the Lord. We are going to talk about the subject of truth truth this accompanies salvation god says not only are you going to be saved and on your way to heaven if you've trusted christ as your savior but god says i'm going to make truth available to you let's have a word of prayer heavenly father thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening i love you lord please bless us now as we study your word i pray holy spirit of god some of these points that i give tonight in the outline is going to resonate with every single person here and I pray that you would help us to embrace the truth. Holy Spirit, give me your power. Dear Lord, give me the mind of Christ. And I just pray your will be done. Bless those that are here, those that are watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. The word truth, in case you're curious as to what the definition of the word truth is, there's actually about 10 different definitions. But let me give you a few of them that, that are applicable to our study tonight. First of all, the word truth means conformity to fact or reality. And that's just basically the general definition of the word truth. When someone you know, says, I'm speaking the truth, what they're saying is I'm speaking factually or what is reality, right? But there's also a, a more of a biblical sense of the word truth, and here's what that means. It means veracity and purity from falsehood. The word truth means that which is uh, veracity, and also it is purity from falsehood. So if you think about the word truth in a biblical connotation, there's absolutely nothing false with it. I mean, it is 100% true, um, factual, uh, you know, reality, but, but it's, it's, you know, the veracity of truth or the veracity of God. The word truth appears in 224 verses in the Bible. Woohoo! 224 verses in the Bible does the word truth appear. And uh, I looked at every one of those verses in preparing my sermon tonight. But uh, let me just give you... 23 bullet points, and I mean, Miss Lavona, get ready. And uh, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a shotgun type of a, a sermon, and we're just gonna just, just shot, shoot it away. But I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on any one of these points. But as I was looking at all 224 verses, man, I could have had a 50 point outline or a 60 point outline, you know. But I took the 23 that the Lord impressed upon my heart that I think would be helpful. For you to know about what God made available. Now, before I give you the 23 points, you remember eight weeks ago, we said uh, things that accompany salvation. Salvation is like going into what kind of a, a house, a mansion, two or three levels, right? How many doors are on the outside of the mansion? Just one door. What's on that door? What's the name? Jesus Christ. Once you go inside, you get saved. The door shut. God will never let you fall out of the mansion. You're, you're saved forever. But what is the mistake that's, that many Christians make once they get saved? 
They just stand still right there inside the entryway. And they don't explore all the rooms and all the different things that accompany salvation. The most important thing about salvation is you get to go to heaven and you don't have to go to hell. Amen? But there's so much else more than that. And so we talked about eight things about that so far. And so this is going to be one of the rooms. The room, the door to the room says truth. And God says, because you're saved, you will have access to the truth. All right, let's get on it. Number one, look at Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter number 24. Obviously, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And I believe this is the first verse that the word truth appears in, if I remember correctly. If not the first, it's the second, but I'm pretty sure it's the first. Genesis chapter number 24, and I'd like you to look down quickly now at verse number 27. Genesis chapter number 24, and look down at verse number 27. Are you there? If you don't know where Genesis is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you, okay? I'm just going to pray for you. All right, Genesis chapter 24, verse number 27, the Bible says this, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Number one, write this down. You will find truth by being in the way. You will find truth by being in the way. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, Abraham, uh, or um, let's see, uh, Abraham sent his um, servant, said, hey, I need you to get a bride for my son Isaac. He, you know, they're in a foreign land, and he said, he's not gonna marry a heathen. I want you to go back and find the bride that my, my, my son's supposed to marry, right? God's will for his life. Now, now, this is in the Old Testament, man. I mean, look, in the Old Testament, a lot of times the parents pick the spouses for their children. This is not that. This is a servant of dad. And uh, so Abraham said, you go back to the home, and he's like, who am I, how am I supposed to know who Isaac's supposed to marry? What am I supposed to do? You know, and he said, God will lead you. So the master went back and he went to the well and met Rebecca. And there's a transaction that took place that it was obvious that it was God's will for Isaac to marry Rebecca. Now, here's what it says, though. It says, and he hath not left my master Abraham destitute of his mercy and truth. And here's why. I being in the way, the Lord led me. You know what he was saying? I was where I was supposed to be at the time I was supposed to be there. And God gave me the truth. Now, what does that mean for you and I? Well, you want truth? Here, you've got to live your life by being in the way. That means be where you are supposed to be when God wants you to be there, and then he'll give you truth. I'll give you a perfect example. When I was a teenager, 17 years of age, I, I started reading my Bible for the first time in my life, reading it with the intent of getting something from it. I'd always read my Bible before, but it really wasn't like my heart wasn't in it. But I started reading the Bible intently, trying to find out what God wanted me to know. And so I came across a verse, I think it was in Proverbs, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I remember, I looked at that and I said, what does that mean, the fear of the Lord? Am I supposed to walk around like all the time like this, just kind of afraid of God? I mean, I, I didn't know what it meant. And here's what I said to myself, you ready? When I go to church Sunday morning, after the service is over, I'm gonna go up to Pastor Ray and I'm gonna ask him, what is the fear of the Lord? Because I don't know what it is. This is me being 17 years of age, right? So I go to church. Now watch this. I, it's funny. I remember this like it was yesterday. I go to church. You know, we go through all the songs and the announcements and the offering and all that. And then Pastor Ray stands up to preach. And he said, today, this morning, I am going to preach on what is the fear of the Lord. He said that. And I was like, my jaw dropped. And so the whole sermon 
was what is the fear of the Lord? I didn't have to ask him afterwards. In fact, afterwards I went up to him and I said, Pastor Ray, I got to tell you this. I said, I was just reading this in the Bible this week and I didn't know what it meant and you preached the whole sermon on it. Now, you ready for this? Let's suppose I wouldn't have gone to church that Sunday morning. I would have missed the truth. Now, I might have got in later, but, but the, 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 the principle is I was where I was supposed to be, when I was supposed to be there, and God gave me the truth that I needed in my life. And that's kind of how it was with the servant of Abraham, and that's how it'll be for you. Number one, you will find truth by being in the way. Number two, look at Exodus chapter 18. Go to Exodus chapter number 18, please. Exodus chapter number 18, and I'd like you to look down, if you would please, at verse number 21. Exodus chapter 18, look down, if you would please, at verse number 21. Are you there yet? All right, keep your Bibles open now. We're going to go from left to right all the way through the Scripture tonight. So the next verse I'm going to point you at is going to be towards the right of where you're at right now. Exodus chapter 18, look at verse number 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, having covetousness or hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Okay, number two, write this down. Be a man of truth and God will use you. Be a man or lady, you know, of truth and God will use you. So right here, Moses was trying, Jethro came to Moses. Now watch this. Jethro came, his father-in-law, and, and observed Moses. He was the judge in Israel. And so what had happened was anybody that had a matter came to Moses, and Moses gave them a judicial decision. Well, Jethro was watching Moses, and he started early in the morning, and he went till way late at night, and it didn't stop all day long, probably at least 12 hours, maybe from seven or eight in the morning to seven or eight at night. And he just kept answering questions and making judgment calls and all that stuff. At the end of the day, Jethro, the father-in-law, came up to Moses and said, hey man, he said, what you're doing is not wise. He said, what do you mean? He goes, they're gonna wear you out. You're the only judge for this two to three million people, Hebrew race, right? And, and they're all coming to you. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to get some able men that can help you pass judgment on these matters. And you get these men and put them over camps, like 50s and 10s and 100s, and let them be over them. And the smaller matters or the matters that are pretty easy to decipher, they can handle that for you. But the hard Harder matter, matters that they don't know the answer to, they'll send them on to you, and that way you only deal with the harder matters, but all the easier matters, they'll take care of that for you. And Moses said, oh, I can do that. And so that's where verse 21 came into play. And so he, he said, God will provide out of all the people, able men, and here's, here's their qualification, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Now, God says, if you are a person of truth, God will find some place for you to serve in his kingdom. Be a man or woman of truth. In other words, let your life be governed by the truth and don't let your life be governed by falsehoods and lies. And then you'll be able to be used of God. Number three, look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. I feel a song coming on. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, and I'd like you to look down at verse number four. Deuteronomy, chapter number 32, and look down at verse number four. Look what it says now. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Number three, write this down. God is a God of truth. Are you with me? God is a God of truth. And that's what it says, just and right is he. So if you ever think, well, is God ever wrong? Does he ever you know, treat people unfairly? Has he ever been unjust? No, they ask, God is a God of truth. Now, when I was in Bible college, I learned this song. And if you've heard me sing it, then you know it. If you haven't heard me sing it, you still ain't gonna know it. But anyway, I'll do my best to help you with it, all right? But um, sing it with me if you know it. 
if you, we'll sing it through twice, but I learned this in Bible college. I never forgot it, and it helps me to memorize Scripture. Ready? Here we go. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Just and right is he. Just and right is he. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. How many of you have never heard that song before? Would you raise your hand? Didn't you hear it just now? Wait a second, you just... I just asked if you before the anyway, okay here right, let's I got you I got you all right let's try it again now we now that you all know it so eloquently because I'm such a great teacher singer all that stuff but anyway here we go let's sing it together he is the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Just and right is he. Just and right is he. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. You know, I love singing scripture. I really do. When you can put a song, a, a melody, to a tune to scripture, it'll help you to memorize it. But here's the truth that we just read. God is a God of truth. You never have to worry about that. God is a God of truth. Number four, look at Joshua chapter 24. Go to the sixth book in the Bible, Joshua chapter number 24. And I'd like you to look down at verse number 14. Joshua chapter 24. Now, again, we're just talking about truth tonight. All of this that we're talking about tonight is available for you because of your salvation. You know when the Bible talks about the world walks in darkness? You know what that means, don't you? It means they're without truth. They're blind to the truth. They don't know what reality is all about. You know, remember what was the, one of the definitions of the word truth? Cert, uh, conformity to fact or reality. You know, the reality is God is real. The reality is there's a heaven and there's a hell. And all, that's, all that is true. And the world doesn't understand that. They're, they're in darkness, especially if they don't believe in heaven or hell or in God. They're, they're blinded in darkness. But because we're saved, God says, I'm going to make truth available to you. Joshua 24, verse 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Now, number, uh, number four, write this down. We should serve God in truth. We should serve God in truth. Now, listen this carefully. One of the biggest problems of our contemporary Christianity in America is we don't serve God in truth. We serve him. I'm talking about churches in America, not we as in Hopewell Baptist Church. Um, the majority of the churches in America, we serve God in the flesh, with our emotion, or just with flat out lies. I mean, just lies. You know, all the, all, for example, all the, all the churches in America that have women pastors, you know, they're just, that's not according to truth. God never, never ordained women to be pastors of churches. Brother Josh and I were talking to a, a person who he said, my mama's a pastor, you know, and told me what kind of church it was, right? And uh, now I, I didn't criticize him. I didn't say anything negative and I never would do that in someone's home, you know, but the fact is that's not according to truth. You know, women have a very important role in the church but it's not pastor, okay? It's just not pastor. But they have a very important role. Now, here's the thing. Um, we're supposed to serve him in truth. Let's look at one other verse along the same lines. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 12. Go to 1 Samuel, just a couple books over to the right. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, then 1 Samuel chapter number 12. And look down at verse number 24. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And Samuel is admonishing the people of Israel at this particular point. You know, they were asking for a king. They said, we want a king like all the heathen. He's like, look, you have a king. It's God. Just let God be your king. They said, no, we want a king that has flesh, 
Someone that we can feel and see and look at and hear talk, and we can't do that with God. And so, uh, at any rate, they, they got Saul, and that turned out disastrous. But if you look at verse number 24 of 1 Samuel chapter 12, look what Samuel said to the people after they desired a king. It says, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. All right, so guess what? When we serve God, you know, by the way, serving God is being active. It's doing something for him, right? When you come to church, if you're active in doing something, like in the ministry, you're serving God, you're serving people, here's what God says, do it according to truth. Do it according to truth. Now, I do wanna just, just briefly, you know, mention this. Churches across America, whether they're Baptist or not, doesn't matter. But a lot of times the leadership does not serve the people in truth. You know, there's abuse, there's, there's uh, manipulation, there's uh, defrauding, you know, there's, there's all kinds of problems. And, and one of the biggest things is they're not serving the people in the church according to truth. And when that happens, it hurts a lot of people. You know, have you ever heard of someone that went to a church and they got abused or mistreated or had some injustice done to them, right? And then it knocks them out of church, maybe even for the rest of their lives. You know, I, I often, often I meet people who say, I will never go to church again, had a bad experience in church. Well, unfortunately, some leaders in churches, they are not serving in truth, but that's what we need to do. If we want God's blessing on our ministry, we've always got to be serving in truth never embrace a lie never embrace a falsehood never embrace um, um a false way you know like i said abuse manipulation <coughs> defrauding <coughs> and um, and things like that you don't want to do that you want to serve god according to truth number five look at first kings chapter three. <sighs> first kings keep going two books to the right first kings brother lee chapter number three Yes, sir. I heard you over there getting me going. First Kings chapter three. And uh, yes, sir. Look down. And just all you got to do is just say, shake that bush, preacher. Pull over and park a while. And uh, there you go. Uh, wait. Uh, 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 what do you say when we pray? You, you say, uh, shake it down. You said, let pastor. Well, you said something before it. You say something to get it up there and then shake it down. You know, bring it up and shake it down. <laughs> something like that. All right. First Kings chapter three. And I look down at verse number six, first Kings chapter three and verse number six, the Bible says, and Solomon said, ready to watch this. Thou hast showed unto thy servant, David, my father, grace, uh, excuse me, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. All right, number six, write this down. Uh, I'm sorry, number five, I'm sorry, number five, write this down. God gives mercy to those who walk in truth. Are you listening to me? God gives mercy, listen carefully. Do you want mercy from God? Do you want God to be merciful to you? Well, listen, if you want God to be merciful to you, you've got to learn to walk in truth. You've got to walk in truth. God loves to give out his mercy, but he's not going to do it for someone who's a scoundrel, someone who's a deceiver, a liar, someone who has embraced a falsehood, someone who doesn't care about what is true. I don't know about you, but every day of my life, I am grateful of God's mercies. You know, I don't deserve what God has done for me. I don't deserve all the blessings that God gives me. At least I don't think I do. But you know, God's so merciful to me. And it's not because I'm perfect or sinless, but I do try as best I can to walk according to truth. And God gives his mercy to us. And that's what he did to King David. Remember, King David wasn't perfect. He committed adultery. He had a man murdered. He got lifted up with pride at one point and numbered the people in Israel, and God judged him for that. And he had all kinds of problems, you know. He, 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 he wasn't always, you know, in the right spirit, in the right frame of mind. But here's what he did. He always pursued God. And he was a man after God's own heart. And in doing that, 
He walked according to truth. And because of that, God gave him mercy. If you want mercy from God, you need to walk according to truth. Next, look at 1 Kings 17. Oh, I like this one. This one really applies, hits home for great mercy. 1 Kings 17. Look down at verse number 24. 1 Kings chapter 17. Look down at verse number 24. This is in reference to Elijah, the man of God. 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse number 24, the Bible says, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Number six, men of God are supposed to speak truth. Men of God are supposed to speak truth. How can you tell if someone is a legitimate man of God? Well, one of the ways you can tell, not the only way, but one of the ways, do they speak the truth? Do they speak the truth? Because if they don't, they're not a true man of God. If they preach a lie, if they're a compromiser, Brother Howes used to call them compromisers. <laughs> he said, go to your dictionary, you college students, and cut out the two words quit and compromise. They're easy to find in the dictionary. They both start with the letter K. That's what he used to say. But uh, cut, cut out quit and compromise. Why? Because if you ever become a compromiser, then you can't be a man of God. You are not speaking the truth. You see... When you come to this church, you know what you should want from me? It, one of the things, not, not the only thing. You should want me to love you. You should want me to, you know, treat people well, things like that. But when it comes to preaching, you should just say, preacher, tell me the truth. I just want to know the truth. I don't care if it rubs me the wrong way. I don't care if it slaps me across the face. I don't care if it steps on my toes. I don't care what it does. I just want to know the truth. And that's the sign that a man is a true man of God, a legitimate man of God, if he speaks the truth. And here's this widow woman. She said, I know that thou art true. You are a man of God because the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth, is truth. Okay, next, let's continue. Uh, look down, if you would, please, at Psalms chapter 15. This is point number seven. Hey, we're moving right along. We're a third of the way through the sermon. It's only 643. I need to slow down a little bit. I'm going too fast. I'm and uh, Psalm, chapter, <laughs> Psalm chapter 15. I think I'm in a hurry. Psalm chapter 15. Psalms, and uh, look at chapter number 15. Look down at verse number 1, please. Psalms 15. Look at verse number 1. Ready? Here we go. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Ready? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Number seven, speak the truth in your heart. Listen to me now. Speak the truth in your heart. Now, what does that mean? Here's what that means. Don't deceive your own self. You know what that means? You're in denial. When you look at the mirror, the Word of God, the spiritual mirror, and you see your reflection in that mirror, don't deny it. Don't wiggle away. Don't try to give some excuse for this, that, and the other. You, you be honest with yourself. One of the most difficult things that the human race as a whole simply has to, has to answer is honesty with themselves. I'll give you another example. It's parents. Their kids are the ones that are always right. Boy, if someone ever corrects their kid or scolds their kids or, you know, whatever, the natural sinful human reaction is, not my kid. Don't you say that about my kid. You know, how many times have people got mad at me over the years in these 29 years that I've been here because I spoke the truth about their kid, but they didn't like it. You know, I got up one time. <laughs> I got up one time and I said, all teenagers, every single teenager that's alive is going to rebel at least once in their teenage years they're going to push the envelope they're going to try to find out where the lines are with mom and dad and they're just i mean it could last for just a week or two it could last for six months or a year i rebelled against my mother for one solid year 
And that's when I was uh, 16, I got a car. I think one of the worst things that happened to me was I got a car at age 16. Because I got that car and I thought, freedom, I bought this car, I own it, I can do what I want, and I don't have to listen to my mama. And for a solid year, I basically, you know, was, had that spirit of rebellion towards my mom. Now, um, every teenager goes through that. I mean, it doesn't have to be a year, but every teenager does that. And I said that one time in, in, uh, in, uh, in church, and that this mother, uh, man, she got mad at me. Not my daughter. No, sir. Not my daughter. She's an angel. Uh, sorry, you're not speaking the truth in your heart. You've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to have an honest evaluation. One of the things that has been a little bit harmful and detrimental to the independent fundamental Baptist movement is that we are right on so much doctrine that we think we're right all the time. And sometimes we need to do a spiritual checkup in our churches. Sometimes we need to evaluate ourselves and maybe we're not right all as much as we think we are. And I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm just talking about what we do. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, people, you know, they, they can get lifted up with pride. You know, I'm right all the time. No, you're not right all the time. Speak the truth in your heart. Sometimes you need to be put in your place. Sometimes you need to get corrected or, or chastened by the Lord. And sometimes you need to go back to school and learn what you thought you knew, but you didn't know. Right. And so in our independent fundamental Baptist churches, one of the things that has happened across America is if something goes wrong in a church, a lot of times people just want to sweep it under the rug and not deal with it. And the fact is, it's best if we deal with it. Because if we look at error head on and correct it, that would be much, much better than for us to say, well, we don't want to hurt the church, so let's just not pretend, let's pretend that error's not there. No, if it's there, we just need to deal with it. We just need to look it straight in the eye. And, um, and, and, and it's called constructive criticism. Constructive criticism. I remember one time this, uh, this preacher down in Texas, he said he had a church member. Once a year, he would meet with him and tell him everything that was wrong with the pastor. He would meet with him once a year and go, I just want to tell you something. This is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And he goes, I met with him every year and I listened to him. And if he got, he, he had 10 things, like let's say he had 10 things he wanted to say to me. Well, nine of them were bogus, but there was one that was true. And when he said it, I went, ouch. And he goes, I wrote that down. I said, I need to work on that. Now, a lot of times people are critical just because they're negative people. But sometimes constructive criticism can be a great asset if you want to walk in truth. And so what that pastor said to us pastors, he was teaching us pastors, he goes, don't look at all criticism and just, just be mad at it. Sometimes constructive criticism can help you if you're not where you're supposed to be or doing what you're supposed to be doing, and that constructive criticism can get you on the right path. And so that's kind of what he was talking. But listen, if you want to be close to God, you got to speak tr the truth in your heart. Next, Psalm 86. Turn to Psalm 86. I hope some of these points are really helpful for you. And uh, not all 23 points are going to speak to your heart, but some of them should. And uh, Psalm 86, and if you would please look down at verse number 11. Oh, I love this one. Psalm 80, this is your attitude every time you come to church. Okay? This is what it should be. Psalm 86, look at verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Number eight, let God teach you truth. Let God teach you truth. It was a great day when I discovered in my own life that I want the word of God to tell me what to believe instead of having what I already believe and trying to find it in the Bible. I just want God to tell me the truth. And sometimes I, I thought I knew the truth, but I didn't. And, and so the psalmist here, he says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. And that way that he was being taught was the way of truth, okay? So let God teach you truth. Don't you ever get to a point where you think you know it all and you, you, you're, you're, you're beyond learning. When you, when you get to that point, then, then you're going to start going downhill as a Christian. I'm 54 years of age. I'm still learning. I remember when Brother Hiles was going through a church split, 
in 1989. When I was sitting in the pews in, at Howes Henderson College in First Baptist Church of Hammond, there was a massive, massive split in, uh, in uh, May of 1989. Uh, there was like 100 you know, uh, um, uh, staff members at the college, I think, 15 or 20 of them all left at once. I mean, we're talking one-fifth of the staff. There was at least 1,000 or 2,000 church members uh, that left the church. You know, Now, they were running 20,000, so then they had you know, 18,000 after. It was not, not a complete split, but nonetheless, they had that. And the, and the week before they left, Brother House stood up and he said, you know what some of you young whippersnappers are mistakenly thinking? That you have grown in your knowledge beyond myself and Dr. Wendell Evans. He said, but what you don't understand is the whole time you're growing in the Lord, we're still growing too. And you think you've grown beyond us and that you know, you know better than us. And he was just trying to help him like, look, you're not the only one that's growing in the truth. He says, we're, you know, Brother House at the time was in his 60s or no, um, yeah, early 60s, I think is what it was, and, um, and, and mid-60s. But at any rate, he said, I've, I've not done growing. I'm still learning every day. I'm still growing in the Lord. And uh, at least uh, afford me that, you know. And, of course, they didn't, and they left, and then, you know, the, the church was blessed by God, and God helped it to grow and all that stuff. But anyway, the point is, let God teach you the truth. Don't ever get to a point where you're beyond learning, you know? Sometimes, you know, I had this one guy that came to this church, you know, oh, this about 15 years ago, whatever it was. He said, you know, he got saved and baptized here. He was here for about a year. And he left. He goes, I'm going to another church preacher. I said, why? What's going on? He goes, well, Hopewell was a great stepping stone. But I'm going to go to another church now and learn more. And, you know, that was just ridiculous. He, he just thought that I, I myself plateaued at a certain level and I wasn't learning myself anymore. And, uh, and he went to another church and now he's not in church anywhere. I mean, you know, he had that, you know, quit-itis. You know, that quit-itis. I quit this church, quit another church. And then, but he couldn't stop quitting and now he's quit for good. But the fact of the matter is, listen, you can, I've been pastoring this church for 29 years. I promise you, I learned more truth in 29 years than I knew when I first started pastoring. And that's how you need to be. Always let God teach you truth. Keep learning. Keep growing. Next, um, let's see here. Psalm 91, verse 4. Go to Psalm 91, verse 4. Psalm 91. Look at verse, oh, I love this verse too. Psalm 91, verse 4. He shall cover thee with the, his feathers. This is talking about the Lord. You know, in verse 1, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, that's God, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But verse 4, it says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Ready? His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Number, number 9, the truth is our shield. The truth is is our shield. What do you use a shield for? Protection. If you embrace the truth, just hide behind it. It'll shield you from harm. The truth is always your friend. If you embrace a lie, that's no shield. You're vulnerable to the attack of the devil. But if you embrace the truth, it will be your shield. I don't know about you, but the devil's real and he fights me and he fights hard, dirty, below the belt, all that stuff. I need a shield. The Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, the shield of faith. In Psalms, it talks about the shield of truth. I need both, man. Give me them both. The truth will always protect you if you embrace it and hold tight to it. Next, look at Psalm, 10, uh, Psalm 100 and then verse 5. Psalm 100. In verse 5, oh, I like this one. Ooh, this is going to be fun. Psalm 100 and verse 5. Psalm 100 and verse 5. Look what it says now. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Do you see that? His truth endureth to all generations. Jump over to Psalm 117. A same thought. Psalm 117 and verse number 2. Now, that one says his truth endureth for all what? Generations. Look at this verse. Psalm 117, <laughs> verse 2. 
Psalm 117, verse 2, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth for what? Ever. So in one verse, it says the truth, his truth endureth all generations. Well, then he says now the truth endures forever. What does that mean? Number 10, truth never changes. Truth never changes. Hey, truth never changes. If it ever was true, it will always be true. New truth never replaces old truth. New truth builds upon the foundation of old truth. You know, when someone says, I learned a new truth, watch this carefully now. If it contradicts old truth, it's not truth at all. If someone says, I've learned a new truth, and it is built upon the foundation of old truth, then okay, I'll listen to you. But the truth of the Lord, it endures for every generation, and it endures forever. That's in the heaven, all right? Every generation is on this earth, the amount of time that man's going to live on this planet, and then forever is how long we're going to be in heaven. Amen? So truth never changes. It's always, if it ever was true, it always will be true. Next, look over, if you would please, at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I remember one time my, um, my, my wife had a family member that criticized her because she was in a Christian school and we charged tuition. And she said, all the material of God's word and all the material in, in church and all this that should always be free for anybody, just for anybody. There's people that, um, that think we're, we're wrong for having a bookstore. Now, I don't think we're wrong. It's not that at all. You know, the, the, the money changers that Jesus overthrew, they were called, he, he called them a den of thieves. Having a bookstore doesn't make us a den of thieves. Y'all understand that? We're not thieving anybody. We're not stealing from anybody. Our bookstore does not make one dime of profit, not even one dime. When we sell an item, we, we replenish the bookstore with another item with that money. So there's not, in all the years that we've had a bookstore, it has never been for profit, never one time. The purpose of having a bookstore is to make Christian material available for those of you that are looking for Christian material. Bibles, music, books, things like that, right? It's not a den of thieves. And, and, and having a Christian school where we charge tuition, that's not wrong either. And here's the verse that proves it. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Ready? What does that say? What's that first word? Ha, 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 ha. By what? There you go. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. You're supposed to buy truth, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Number 11, write this down. Pay the price necessary to get truth. It says buy the truth. What do you, what do you buy with? Right here. This is how you buy it. You pay a price to get it. This is one way to buy it, by the way, not the only way. But um, uh, the fact of the matter is, God says, buy the truth. If truth is out there, don't expect it to be for free. You pay a price to get it. Now, it could be hard work. It could be cash. It could be labor. You know, you could, you know, whatever. But I mean, like, there's a way for you to buy it. Do whatever is necessary to pay the price to get truth. You know what I said all these years? I was willing to pay the price for my kids to go to a Christian school because I wanted them to have a godly education. And I do not believe in the public school system of America is godly. It's not godly at all. So the fact of the matter is, you know, while other people were buying cars, you know, I admire parents who paid for their children to have a Christian education. You could have spent that money on anything. God says, buy the truth and sell it not. So what does that mean for you and I? If truth is out there, don't expect it to be free. Don't expect it to just be handed to you. What you need to do is pay the price necessary to get the truth, buy it, and then sell it not. He says, once you buy the truth, don't you give it up. Don't you sell it in a, yum, in a, in a yard sale, a rummage sale. Don't you say, I got the truth, I paid for it, but I don't want it anymore, so I'm going to offer it in a discount, y'all come get it. No, it says sell it not. All right, let's continue. Look at Zechariah chapter number 8. Zechariah 
chapter number 8. Zechariah Malachi. Woohoo! Learn this little song and you will find where they belong and you will find them without frustration. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 8. Look at verse 19. Zechariah. Are you there yet? If you're not, you hadn't learned that little song to find where they belong. All right, that's what the deal is. Zechariah chapter 8. Look at verse 19. Ready? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth <laughs> and peace. Number 12, write this down. Love the truth. Love it. Let me ask you a, que let me ask you a question. What, what is it that you love? Do you really love the truth? If you love the truth, you will never get mad at it. If you get, if the truth slaps you across the face, you'll still love it. What is it that you love? Most of the time, what I've learned in 29 years is people love to feel good. <clears throat> they don't necessarily love the truth. They love to feel good. So if they come to church and feel good, they'll keep coming. But if they ever come to church and they don't feel good because of a sermon that I preach, then they're out of here. Right? Because whether I told the truth or not, it's they love to feel good. Um, some people love to be told that they're right. I had this one person, <coughs> actually <coughs> more than one person in 29 years, but one per person in particular came to me and said, you know why I come to Hopewell? I said, why? Because I'm good looking? Because my dad jokes are great? Because I'm just the most awesomest pastor in the whole world. Is that why? No. I, I, said, <laughs> I, I said, why? He goes, because I finally found a church that preaches what I believe. Problem. He's no longer here. You know why? Because eventually I preached something that he didn't believe. He w loved to be told that he was right. And when he had a belief and then he came to church and I preached it, guess what that did for him? It told him he was right. But if I ever stood up and preached the Bible, but he personally didn't believe it ahead of time, he had to change his belief or get mad at me. And he eventually got mad at me and left the church. Some people love to be told they're right. I don't, I don't love that. I don't have to be right. I just love the truth. I want the truth. Just give me the truth. Tell me the truth. I love the truth. Next, look over at uh, John chapter 4. Let's go to the New Testament for a while. Hey, we're doing good. It's only 7.04. I slowed down a little bit. And I got to pick up the pace a little bit. I, um, we're halfway through. John chapter number 12. Let's get a little faster again. John chapter number 12. We got... Um, chapter 4, I mean. John chapter 4. We got one, two, three, four, five verses in John that we're going to look at the next five points. So we'll probably get through this pretty quickly. John chapter number 4. Look down at verse number 23. This is a familiar verse. I preached about it before. John chapter, this is talking about the woman at the well. You know, the, the chapter in the Bible where we come up with the name Hopewell. That's John chapter 4. Look at verses 23 and 24. It says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Number 13, we must worship God in truth. We have to. You know, all these praise and worship stuff going on in churches all over America, they may be worshiping God in spirit, but sadly, many of them are not worshiping God in truth. And that doesn't, that doesn't cut it with God. We've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. I am not against praise and worship. I am against praise and worship that has spirit, but it does not have truth. It has error and falsehood. You're never supposed to look at the world's music and embrace it and just change the words. The whole, look, the whole thing about the world's music is wrong. Not just the words, but the beat, the song, the, the, the melody, all of that, the harmony. It's all wrong. 
it's, it's not godly, and, and it has an agenda. So what I look for, if I'm going to worship God in church, yes, I'm supposed to worship him in spirit. That's fine. But it also has to be in truth. It has to be in truth because that's the only way God, he, it says he seeketh true worshipers that means there's a lot of false worshipers out there if you see that in verse number 23 the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father why did he say true worshipers because there were false worshipers right because if there were no such a thing as false worshipers he wouldn't have used the word true he would have just simply say the hour cometh now and is when the worshipers shall worship the father no he said the true worshipers because there are false worshipers there are false churches, false music, false worship, false you know, doctrine, all that stuff. And so here's what he says. If you're going to worship me, always worship me in truth. All right, next. Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. Look down at the, a little bit down the chapter. Look what it says now. For Jesus, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I was in John chapter 4. We're in John chapter, go to John chapter 8. Turn over to John chapter 8, verse 44. There you go. John chapter 8. Don't ever forget this point. Okay, pay attention to this point, please. Please pay attention. John chapter 8, verse 44. Ready? Are you there? Here we go. Year of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Ready? And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Number 14, I'm sorry. Um, yep, number 14, write this down. The devil has no truth in him. None. He, not only, it says, he abode not in the truth. In other words, he didn't dwell in the truth. There absolutely is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of it. That's all he is. Please do not be misled by the devil's lies. Oh, boy. I think this is across the board in every facet of life. I'm 54, a bunch of stinking 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds thinking the devil's lies are true. They let the devil take him out of church, take him away from God, they're believing the lie of the devil. You listen to me. There is no truth in the devil. Do not believe him. Nothing but a lie. Nothing but a lie. Look at verse 32. John chapter 8. This is a famous verse. I won't spend much time on it, but it says this, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Number 15, write this down. The truth will make you free. You know, all these young whippersnapper kids 16, 17, 18, 19. I want to be free, do my own thing. I'm a man. I can decide for myself what I'm going to do. Buddy, huh, if you do not embrace the truth, you are going to live a life of bondage. It is the truth that makes you free. You know, here's what they say. I'm a man. I can drink alcohol. No, you're going to be a, you're going to be a slave to alcohol. I can smoke marijuana, everything's okay. Colorado made legal. No, you're gonna be a slave to marijuana. You, you know, everyone that I've everyone that I've ever talked to just about, about internet pornography, they hate themselves for watching it. But they say I am a slave to it. I can't get away from it. It it has me in bondage. You know, if you knew the preachers that were addicted to pornography, it would shock you. It would shock you. I remember one time a pastor stood up and he said this to his church, a large church. He said, studies show, I think the figure was 80% of teenagers and young adults, 90% of teenagers and young adults have been exposed to pornography. And then he said, 80% of them are addicted to it. That's what he said. So here's what he said. Every 10 people, 
that's in this church that's in that category, you know, teenager, young adult, right? You know, 20s, eight, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He said the, the statistics across America, not the statistics in individual churches, the statistics across America, that age bracket, 90% of them have been exposed to it. 80% of them are addicted to it. Do you know why? Because internet pornography is not true. It's not truth. It is a lie of the devil. And as long as you believe the lie of the devil, it is going to keep you in bondage for the rest of your life. John chapter 8, verse 32, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You want to live a life of freedom? You want to truly be free? The truth will keep you free. It'll make you free. A lie, it'll enslave you and keep you with chains around your wrists and your ankles. You'll have a ball and chain at your ankle, and it will, it will control you the rest of your life. Let's continue. Look at John chapter 14. Here's another famous verse. By the way, preachers need to say what I just said. And you know what? Adults that don't have a problem like you 30, 40, 50 year olds, 60 year olds that don't have a problem with internet pornography. Don't you get mad if I talk about it because there's a bunch of teenagers in this world and 20 year olds that are addicted to it. And someone needs to stand up and tell the truth about it. And if you're not going to hear the truth at church, where are you going to hear it? You're not going to hear it anywhere else. Next, John 14, verse 6. Look what it says now. John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Number 16, Jesus is the truth. Woo-hoo. Jesus is the truth. You want to know truth? You better get, get to know Jesus. Get to know him. What did Steve Currington used to tell us in Reformers Unanimous? Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Then he said, you know what I found out? John 14, 6, Jesus is the truth. He said, the more I got to know Jesus, the more freedom I got from my addiction. Jesus is the truth. Get to know him. You'll know truth better. Next, look at John 17, verse 17. Just a couple chapters to the right. John 17, verse 17. I like this one. John 17, verse 17. Jesus is praying. This is the Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17, look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the whole chapter, this is the Lord's Prayer. When he told his disciples he was teaching them how to pray, he said, you say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, all that. That's not the Lord's Prayer. This is. And part of the Lord's Prayer, in verse 17, he said this, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Number 17, God's word is is truth. If you would base your life on this book right here, you will be basing your life on truth. Let this book tell you what to believe. Let this book tell you how to live. Ye shall know the truth, and truth shall make you free. Where's the truth? The truth is in Jesus. The truth is in his word. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You know, and that's why it's so dangerous to change God's word. That's why I'm, I'm against all the modern versions. I want to mess with them. Don't you change God's word. If you change God's word, you have changed the truth. And now you have a lie. Amen? Just give me the old King James from 1611. Yeah, it's got some archaic words that are hard for us to pronounce maybe. Maybe it's a little difficult for us to understand the meaning, some of the words. But bless God, that's what dictionaries are for. You don't want to change the word. Leave the word alone. Why? Because God's word is truth. Next, look over, if you would, please. Number 18, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 13. I, I am seeing the end of the runway. I can see the runway. The landing gear is out. We're getting ready to land. Second, did I say Chronicles? 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. I, I'm sleep deprived. You have to have mercy on me now. Stayed up all night in prayer. I'm not, I'm not doing so great. Pray for me. I need to go home and go right to bed. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse number 8. Oh, look at this verse. Oh, my soul. What a powerful verse. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. Number 18. Write this down. 
we can do nothing against the truth. Watch this carefully. You know what you can do to the truth? You can believe it or you can reject it. You can believe it to be true or you can believe it to be a lie. It doesn't matter, but guess what? It will never change the truth. You can do nothing against the truth. You know what that means? Truth will always be truth whether you receive it and believe it or not. You can do nothing against the truth. A person can get up and say, there is no God. He can say it all he wants. But you know what he's doing? The very fact that he's invoking God's name, he is giving credence to the fact that God is real. You ever heard, a, you ever heard an atheist cuss and take Jesus' name in vain? Or say God blanket, you know what I'm saying? Why would they say it if they, if they say there is no God? The very fact that they take his name in vain is credence to the fact that he is real. You ever, you know, is Spider-Man real? <laughs> no, he's not. He's a made-up, fictitious, comic book superhero. You ever heard anybody go, oh, Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man blanket, you know, whatever. No, they don't do that because Spider-Man's not real. But the reason they take God's name in vain is because they know it's real. And every time, you can do nothing against the truth before the truth. Have you ever heard something like this? There is no such thing as negative press. Have you ever heard something like that? If, there's, if they're talking about you, it can always be, you know, be used for good, right? It's the same thing about truth. There is no such thing as negative press to the truth. If you're talking about the truth, all you're doing at least is endorsing it at the very least. Next, look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. If you ever talk to an atheist who says there is no God and you're trying to witness to him, just ask him, you ever take God's name in vain? Why do you do that if there is no God? You'll get them. I've, I've done that to atheists before. Have you ever said God, you know, blank? Have you ever said Jesus Christ as a cuss word? Well, why would you if they're not real? Ha, 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 get you. Galatians chapter number 4, look at verse number 16. Galatians 4, verse 16, it says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Number 19, write this down. Never get mad at the messenger of truth. <laughs> Don't ever get mad at the messenger of truth. The messenger is not the one that created the truth. He's just delivering the truth. And here's Paul. He's preaching the truth to the people of Galatia. He led most of them to Christ. And he started that church in Galatia. And he said, why am I your enemy? Because I'm telling you the truth. Do you want me not to tell you the truth? Don't make me your enemy because I'm telling the truth. The messenger of truth. You should never get mad at him. Never, never, never. Number 20, look at Galatians 5 and verse 7. Look at this one. Galatians 5, 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Number 20, write this down. Don't let anyone hinder you from obeying the truth. Don't let anyone hinder you from obeying the truth. Have you ever seen someone fall out of God's will? And most of the time people say, what in the world happened to them? It'd be better for you to say, who in the world happened to them? Usually it's a who, not a what. Sometimes it is a what. But most of the time, it's a who. And here's what Paul was saying to the church at Galatia. We're almost done. In fact, we're on time, so we're not late. Listen carefully. He said to them, you did run well, church of Galatia. He said, who hindered you that you stopped obeying the truth? It's always a who that hinders us if we don't obey the truth. Don't let, listen, listen. Don't let your spouse, don't let your brother or sister or friend or anybody get in between you and the truth. Don't let anybody, don't choose anybody over the truth. You always choose the truth over them. Next, number 21. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We got three more references to look at. And we are all done for the night. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 4. Now this is an awesome verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
In verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Anybody that says God has predestinated people to go to hell, they are so off base. God says right here, number 21, God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. In fact, he says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What is God's will? Is it for people to go to hell? No. God's will is for all men to be saved and all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Number 22, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, just one chapter over. Look at verse 15. This is a familiar verse. We've read it before and preached it before. <laughs> 1 Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, ready, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You want to learn the truth? Number 22, write this down. God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Do you know what is not the pillar and ground of the truth? The White House public schools, state universities, the state capitals. Those are not the pillar and ground of the truth the church is. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm never going to church again? You ever heard someone say that? You know what they're saying? I am never going to go find what the truth is ever again. Just leave me alone. Let me, live, let me believe and live in a lie. Just leave me alone. I am never going to church again. The Bible says the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. If you ever want to know what truth is, you better get to church. Number 23, and last. Dun, 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 dun. woo We made it. Go to 3 John, chapter 1. We started in 2 John. We're ending in 3 John. <sighs> Third John, chapter 1. Third John, chapter 1. We're going to read one verse. Verse number 4. Ready? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John is not speaking of a physical parent, a physical father. John the apostle was talking about being a spiritual mentor, father. Um, he was saying, I led you to Christ. I gave birth to this church. And now he's, he's away from the church. But he says, not, not, not away from church, but in another place in another church, right? He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, y'all, are walking in truth. Number 23 and last, there is no greater joy than to hear our children walk in truth. Now that applies to two things. Ready? A parent, the biggest heartbreak that a child can give to their parent is to abandon the truth. You want to make your mom and dad proud of you, children? Walk in truth. Walk in truth. Now, wait a second. God's our heavenly father, right? Do you want to make our heavenly father proud of you if you're his child, if you're saved? Guess what? You'll make your heavenly father proud of you if you walk in truth. That's all you got to do. Just walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Tonight, we've learned one of the great things that accompanies salvation is the fact that now that you're saved, there is a room in this mansion. The door says truth. If you open the door and go in it, you will have access to truth. And I don't know about you, but I really do love the truth. Give me the truth. Forget the lies. Forget the good feelings only. Forget the popularity. Forget the political correctness. Just give me the truth. And God says, if you're saved, you have access to truth. Don't miss it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord, and I thank you, Father.